It's the aircraft that changed the face of air-to-air -air combat. You could tell this was absolutely a dominant fighter. It turned the tide of aerial warfare back in America's favor and raised the standard to staggering heights. Its kill ratio is 104 to zero. This is unprecedented in aerial warfare. This is the inside story of an aviation giant. How did the Air Force F-15 overcome its skeptics and survive tragedy? How did it come to dominate the skies of Earth and blaze its way into the heavens beyond? There were those who thought it could never be done. January 1999. Yugoslavia's President Slobodan Milosevic's ethnic cleansing campaign tears his country apart. Serbian militias massacre Bosnians and ethnic Albanians. Terrified refugees pile up along the borders. It's winter, there's nowhere to go. Thousands of people have been forced from uh, villages, from their homes, at gunpoint. NATO hatches a bold new plan. Operation Allied Forces aims to defeat the Serbs from the air. NATO was very afraid to get into a quagmire of a European ground war. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Schauer was the weapons officer of an F-15 squadron used in Operation Allied Force. It was really the first time in history that we've tried to do this strictly by air power, to attack a country and not have any ground forces involved. An air war is imminent, but there's a problem. Serbia's air defense system is formidable, thanks to the country's close ties to Russia. The Russians sold military hardware to the Serbians. A lot of their training was from Russian forces. So they're very tied heavily with the Russian military in general. NATO's air war could stir up Cold War tensions, but there's little choice. The risk of not taking action is far greater than the risks of what we're doing. March 1999, night one of the war. 16 coalition planes head towards Serbian airspace, ready to rumble. To lead this charge, the Air Force leans on its go-to fighter jet, the F-15. Sleek, swift, and very deadly. It's the Air Force's weapon of choice when there's any real chance of air-to-air -air combat. The F-15 was designed for the primary purpose of establishing air dominance. Two Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines give the F-15 a top speed of Mach 2.5. That's two and a half times the speed of sound. This is where all the thrust comes from. You can see it's slightly charred. That's because there's a lot of heat and a lot of energy coming out of these. The F-15 can fly three times as fast as a 747 passenger jet. Its massive engines generate over 50,000 pounds of thrust. For us, it's the amount of push behind the aircraft providing us the speed so that we can outclimb an opponent. Back in Eastern Europe, two F 15s escort 10 F 117 stealth fighters and two B 2 bombers into Serbian airspace. $10 billion of high end aircraft, all under the guard of the F 15. The bombers are specialists in hitting ground targets, but can do little air-to-air. -air. If Serb fighters detect them, the F-15s may be their only hope of survival. It only takes one to get through, and we didn't see him until he gets behind one of our guys and shoots him down, and that's a big deal. It could put a stop on the whole air war. 
Sure enough, minutes into his flight, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Schauer spots an unidentified aircraft. We knew the only aircraft the Serbians had an alert were MiG-29s. They had about 14 of them. We got there and did about one spin in the cap and turned back around, and I saw a radar blip pop up. I go, somebody's flying. A few miles down the way, he turns around, and now I see that radar blip. Instead of staying about the same place, starts getting closer to me. And I go, ooh, 25 miles away now. Shower is in the hot seat, complicated by a unique set of circumstances. The air war over Kosovo was very different from the war in the desert a few years earlier. Author Dr. Rebecca Grant is one of the foremost civilian experts on Air Force history and aircraft. The coalition aircraft flying for NATO were operating in a much smaller airspace. Over Kosovo, the MiGs from the Serbian Air Force were able to mix in much more closely than we would have liked with friendly aircraft. In such close quarters, there's no margin for error, and time is not on your side. Let's say two fighters are both going about Mach 1, so they're about Mach 2 at closure. You're closing a mile about every three seconds, so you don't have very long. Even if you're starting at 25 or 30 miles apart, you might have 15, 20 seconds to work on this before it's getting really, really dangerous. Shower has just seconds to determine whether he's facing an enemy or a friendly aircraft. He turns to the radar, housed in the F-15's long nose. The radar sends a coded electronic signal requesting information from the unknown aircraft. That radar can tell you a lot of detail about an aircraft, and not just altitude, speed, heading, etc., but maybe what kind of aircraft is it? Is it a MiG-29, a Su-27, is it a 747? Pilots call the signal, reply or die. If the challenging aircraft is friendly, it responds immediately. The plane racing toward Michael Shower, however, stays silent. Immediately I go, within just about two seconds, I go, that's MiG-29, I know. My blood pressure was definitely starting to go up. Shower quickly realizes that the MiG is not closing in on him, but on one of the precious F-117s behind him that he's charged with protecting. Shower has to aim his missile with pinpoint precision. He puts his hand on the trigger and fires. It goes into a big fireball. So I see the fireball, and I watch the aircraft kind of spiral into the ground, because obviously I say splash one, splash one on the radio, and watch it impact the ground. Splash one means not only a hit, but a kill. And this splash one comes just in the nick of time. They came within just a few thousand feet of having the Serbian MiG close in on the F-117s. There's no question that this pilot, Captain Michael Schauer, had saved some of the F-117s. With the Serbian MiGs no longer a threat, the B-2s and F-117s get to work, wiping out dozens of military targets. The F-15s were once again in the lead, clearing the skies of Serbian MiGs and enabling NATO to carry on that air war and stop the humanitarian tragedy going on in Kosovo. After two months of bombing, Milosevic gives up. Led by the F-15s, Operation Allied Force proves that a war can be won by air power alone. Mr. Milosevic accepted these conditions for one reason. You made him do it. This isn't the first time the F-15 has gone head-to-head -head with the MiG. The F-15's dominance has extra significance. It's because of the MiG that the F-15 first came into being. May 
1967. The United States is two years into an ugly war with North Vietnam. U.S. forces aren't just getting killed on the ground. They're taking a pounding in air combat, too. The Vietnam War early on was a huge shock to the American concept of air superiority. There is no doubt that air power was not as dominant as it had been in World War II. Dick Anderegg was the director of the Air Force History and Museums program. He commanded an F-15 squadron for two years. The Air Force coming into the Vietnam War, it had been designed to be a nuclear force to shoot radar missiles at large bomber-sized targets in a nuclear war scenario. But the war over North Vietnam wasn't like that. The aircraft there were small fighter-sized targets, highly maneuverable at much lower altitudes. The disadvantage for the U.S. pilots was that they were flying heavier aircraft, not designed for air combat. North Vietnam's premier dogfighter is the small, tough MiG. It's built and sold behind the Iron Curtain. Vietnam took place during the height of the Cold War. And in the Cold War, the Soviet Union and its allies in the Eastern Bloc and around the globe were our staunch enemies. North Vietnam got its MiGs from the Soviet Union. The MiGs were small, very agile, and their pilots, although few in number, were quite well trained. The North Vietnamese shoot down almost two U.S. aircraft a day. The cost is more than just the planes. The demographic of the prisoner of war population in North Vietnam and Hanoi was almost totally airmen. In the Hanoi Hilton and other prisoner of war camps in North Vietnam, the population there were almost exclusively Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps airmen. Inadequate planes, thousands of pilots captured or killed. It's a big wake-up call for the U.S. Air Force. The air combat experience in Vietnam almost immediately indicated that the U.S. had the wrong type of airplanes to go up against the Soviet mix. Just when it seems things can't get worse, Russia unveils its latest threat. The Soviet Union always liked to show off its top military equipment in big public displays. It was done with a view towards intimidating the West. One plane grabs U.S. attention immediately. It's called the MiG-25. It's a more advanced version of the plane that is beating them in Vietnam. To Western analysts, it looked like the MiG-25 might be the most dominant fighter ever built. Analysts estimated that it might be able to fly in excess of Mach 2, maybe even Mach 3. That means three times the speed of sound. It was received as a threat. Here's another leap into the next generation of fighter aircraft that we don't see that we have anything that can match right now. Suddenly, it looks like the United States isn't just going to lose Vietnam. It's going to lose the Cold War, too. The U.S. Air Force knew they had to build a true air superiority fighter and get it into production as quickly as possible. December 1968. The United States Air Force gathers at the Pentagon. Their new $15.4 million weapons program demands the impossible. A combat fighter that can shoot any Soviet plane out of the sky. At first, the Air Force wasn't sure what approach to take. What was going to be more important, the ability to turn and burn and get the advantage over your opponent, or pure speed? As they look to the future, the list of requirements grows. 
We need to be able to see and we need to be able to dogfight. We need to be able to pick up the target at long range with a radar that can see not only above the horizon, but below the horizon. And if we get in close, then we need to be able to be very powerful, very agile, very maneuverable, and be able to fight visually as well. The Air Force reviews dozens of potential designs. The Air Force put out requests for proposals for a new fighter that fall. They went out to all of American aerospace industry at that point, specifically McDonnell Douglas, General Dynamics, Fairchild Republic, North American, etc. Finally, aviation giant McDonnell Douglas comes up with the goods. McDonnell Douglas got to work very fast. The first F-15 rolled out of the production facility in St. Louis just 30 months later. July 1972, the McDonnell Douglas plant in St. Louis, Missouri. The Air Force rolls out a brand new fighter, the first it's commissioned in almost 20 years. They call it the F-15 Eagle. I christen the Eagle, and may you reign supreme in your domain. Here, here. It simply looks like no other aircraft that you've ever seen. It's streamlined for speed. It has the ability to withstand the gravitational forces. Its aerodynamic qualities are truly original. It looks like no other fighter that came before it. One of the key parts of the design, the cockpit. It was essential to give the pilot a 360 degree view so that he could see any angle of attack by an enemy fighter. You look up through that cockpit and you know that you are in a position to dominate the whole sky around you. What the pilot can't see with his own eyes, he can use the F-15's radar to track. The F-15 had something else that made it dominant, and that was its ANAPG-63 radar. This revolutionary new radar is so powerful that it can spot enemy fighters way beyond the pilot's visual range. With the beyond visual range radar, it was possible to take what pilots now call a BVR shot. What that meant essentially was that the pilot could detect an incoming enemy fighter, line up a shot all before that fighter knew that it was under attack. The Pentagon is impressed, but pilots see a problem. The F-15 appears to have one fatal flaw. I think the biggest surprise was how big it was. Uh, we had just been fighting small MiGs in North Vietnam, and so we knew that small was an advantage, especially if you're dogfighting. So when the F-15 and its large size came out, we went, hmm. Wow, this is a big airplane. As these large fighters roll off the assembly line, the Air Force must also roll out an elite class of pilots ready for the challenge. There was no question that the Air Force chose to put its best pilots into the F-15. Why wouldn't you? You have to have your best pilots to get the best capability out of a top air superiority fighter. It starts with a year in the undergraduate pilot training program. There are no vacations, no days off. It's tough. Wannabe pilots study subjects like aeronautics and aerospace physiology. Weekly tests rank them in order of performance. Those who can't cut it drop out. F-15 is a very highly desired uh, assignment, so only the top ones get it. So by the time you get to the F-15 training, you have a handful of people that have been through many, many competitions, many, many selections, survived all of those, and come out on the top. Then there's the physical component. Pilots spend hours getting tossed around in a centrifuge, learning not to pass out from the mass of acceleration. You have to be physically fit, and I mean game fit because flying these airplanes is very, very physically demanding. When you're sitting in a cockpit and you can pull nine times your body weight for 30 or 40 seconds in a turn, you have to be physically fit to withstand those kind of G-forces. 
Today, it takes pilots almost two and a half years to earn their wings. By the time they do, they have studied hundreds of possible air combat and emergency scenarios. I'd say the hardest part about being a fighter pilot is just the preparation and mentally relying on your training, um, making sure that that's second nature so that you can actually do the mission. Basically being ready for anything. The pilot's motto, bring it on. And three years after the plane debuts, the first group of F-15 pilots decides to show the world what their new toy is made of. January 1975, Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota. An F-15 pilot puts on a high altitude pressure suit and prepares to test an F-15 Streak Eagle. His goal, to push the limits of what's possible and see how fast and how high the new fighter can go. The F-15 takes off. 17 seconds later, it's flying faster than the speed of sound. It tilts upward, executing an almost vertical climb. In just three minutes, the F-15 rockets up to 98,000 feet, faster than any plane that's ever been built. Anyone who flew or saw the F-15 in flight was pretty confident that this was the true air superiority fighter that the Air Force wanted so badly. It's a triumph for the Air Force, especially because the record was previously held by its old enemy, the Soviet MiG. But with the Vietnam War over, the F-15 still has to prove itself in battle gets its chance in a most unexpected place. Nineteen seventy nine, the Cold War spreads to the Middle East. The Soviets arm countries like Syria and Egypt with their most advanced weapons. Its top seller, the MiG. Israel looks to the U.S. for support. It must protect itself against the growing threat. We've always had quite a relationship with the Israeli Air Force where we've traded knowledge of airplanes and tactics. When they saw the F-15, they wanted the F-15 for obvious reasons. By June 27, 1979, the Israelis operate 25 of the new American jets. The new weapon comes just in time. A few minutes before noon, four Syrian MiG-21s zoom towards Israeli airspace. A surprise attack. The Israelis detect the threat and alert four F-15s they have on routine patrol. I remember the, the horizon were very, very clear, and uh, below us there were a little bit of clouds, and we got the green light to go and intercept the, the MiGs. Brigadier General Moshe Melnik was one of the Israeli Air Force's top fighter pilots for over 38 years. On that day in 1979, he's in the hot seat of an aircraft never before tried in combat. We got a very immediate uh, locks, um, uh, radar locks um, uh, on, the, on the MiGs. It was uh, in a distance of about uh, 30 or 25 miles. And we got permission to, to fire. To determine when and where to fire, Melnik relies on the F-15's heads-up display. The heads-up display, or HUD, 
is a piece of transparent glass located on top of the pilot's instrument panel. Airspeed, altitude, targets, they're all displayed right in front of the pilot's eyes. All the controls that you needed to do that were on the stick and the throttles. So you never have to take your hands off to move anything while you're dogfighting. Everything is at your fingertips. Melnick's heads-up display shows that the MiG is approaching fast. This is Moshe Melnick's actual video. Melnick launches one of his missiles. It misses. Now the MiGs are on high alert. The MiGs were turning, took a very sharp turn to the north because they have seen the missiles and that's how you protect against the missiles. So the, the radar lock was broken and it was obvious that these missiles are not going to hit the MiGs. The MiGs counterattack, roaring toward Melnik at 650 miles per hour. Melnik has to come up with another strategy quickly or risk getting shot. One of the F-15's strengths, it has more than one way to take down an enemy fighter. We have several weapons available, uh, one of which being a, a long-range mighty AMRAAM. The AMRAAM is a beyond visual range missile, meaning that once the pilot locks into a target, the AMRAAM's radar guides it towards the kill. They call this feature fire and forget. Pilots can launch the missiles from almost any side of the plane. These are the fuselage stations. So we have two on either side. This is called the eagle, the eagle claw, that when you are in a, a firing solution, you hit the uh, pickle button, it will eject the, the uh, AMRAAM out into the slipstream, forward fire the motor, and it's on its way uh, to deal death. For closer targets, the F-15 carries heat-seeking missiles like the AIM-9L Sidewinder. For anyone who gets past the missiles to face it up close, the F-15 has yet another weapon. This is the, uh, the mighty M61A1 Gatling gun. It provides 6,000 rounds per minute in a high rate of fire, which is 100 rounds per second. And that is a lot of firepower uh, at your fingertip. Over Israel, it's clear that F-15 pilot Moshe Melnik is in a dogfight to the death. And his first missiles have missed. Now you have two choices. Get a, a new radar lock, or to get, go back to the old pilot habit, good habits, and to use your best radar in the world, your eyes. Melnik sets his sights on the mix. Now just seconds away. This time, he turns to a missile designed specifically for the Israeli F-15s. It's called the Python-3. This missile has a name in Hebrew called the uh, um, uh, Choach. Choach is a abbreviation of God forbid. God forbid that you will encounter this missile in the, in the air was in, in range and I pressed the trigger and I took the first shot. And this missile hit first the first MiG. Less than 30 seconds after Melnik first got the alert, the Israeli F-15s defeat the Syrian MiGs. This was the first time the F-15 faced a MiG in combat. And the world could see that any time the F-15 came up against a MiG, the F-15 would win. Moshe Melnik becomes the first pilot to show the world the lethal qualities of this new fighter. I'm so proud and so happy to be the first that actually um, uh, proved its abilities in, in the combat. The MiG, king for so long, dominant in Vietnam, is finally toppled. Over the next five years, Melnik and the other Israeli pilots go on to use every single weapon in the F-15's arsenal. 
shooting down over 60 MiGs. As F-15 pilots, we followed the actions of the Israeli Air Force pretty closely. I don't think by 1980 there was a fighter pilot in the free world that had any doubt that the F-15 on, in one-to-one -one combat would defeat any other fighter in the world, any place, any time. The only question was, could it fight well enough to overcome its size disadvantage of it being a big airplane? And the Israelis showed that to be absolutely the case. It seems like the F-15 is the perfect weapon, so perfect that the U.S. military decides to give the F-15 its most challenging mission yet, to conquer outer space. 1985, the Pentagon. The U.S. military has been locked into a cold war with the Soviet Union for nearly 40 years. When the Cold War was going on, we and the Soviets had a little um, contest going on of who could be beat their chest the biggest. Major General Wilbert D. Pearson commanded the Air Force Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base, California. The Soviets had built their empire. They had expanded around the borders of Russia, and they were interested in protecting that. So they had forces massed. They were very interested in continuing to expand or at least protecting what they had. Russia versus the U.S., spy versus spy, each determined to gain control of the ultimate high ground, space. The Soviets would put up satellites frequently, take pictures, and very, very accurately keep up with United States military forces. They could very quickly launch satellites in a matter of hours and launch a lot of them. The Pentagon sees the satellites as a dangerous threat to national security. They already have deployed an anti-satellite missile. They can knock down and have knocked down uh, satellites that have been sent up in their testing. We wanted to have a capacity to be able to shoot down satellites, and we didn't have the capacity to do it satellite to satellite, so we tried it off the F-15. In theory, the F-15 made sense. It was powerful enough that it could carry a 3,000-pound rocket and it could carry it to the altitudes and at the velocities that would allow the rocket to launch and, and go up into space. It sounds like science fiction, but it was a very real plan with very high stakes. Success might have the Soviets rethinking their entire spy satellite program. Failure could allow the program to continue unchecked. This is a very, very difficult thing to do. You talk about something you have to be perfect. I mean, that thing's going 17,000 miles an hour. That satellite that's in orbit, it's going 17,000 miles an hour. You, you can't be off X number of feet left and right, or it'll be, it'll be by you before you have a chance to do anything. The satellite chosen for destruction an out-of-date American research satellite called P-78-1. The man chosen to destroy it, Major General Pearson. When they asked me would I consider doing it, it took me about two milliseconds to answer. I wanted to be a part of it, because uh, space uh, was always where the, I thought the next war was gonna be fought. September 13th, 1985, Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. At 12.40 in the afternoon, Pearson straps into his F-15. There's a 2,700-pound, 18-foot-long missile mounted to the jet's center line. OK, this is Pearson in 084. We're 64 seconds from I had worked so hard to understand and make sure that we didn't miss anything. It was just. It, was, it really wasn't something you thought about on, on the day of. You just did it. 
At 1258, Pearson takes off. This is actual video from his flight. We can fly right turn out of Port Mason. Okay. The satellite is 345,000 feet above the Earth. It's moving at 23,000 feet per second. Once his F-15 reaches 30,000 feet, Pearson has just a 10-second window to fire the missile. If his timing is off, he'll miss it completely. Mark, waypoint two at point eight six knots. Rocketing into the air, Pearson pulls the F-15 into a steep climb. At 35,000 feet, he fires. An infrared honing device on the rocket guides it as it heads into the sky. The F-15 has done what no other plane has been able to do conquer the heavens. And then as the rocket went up, it created a contrail, large plume of smoke, and I watched that as far as I could, and it was pretty, it was a moment. It was a real moment. Hey, hey, you beautiful son of a bitch. It was almost anticlimactic uh, because so much work and so much practice and so much training uh, went into it to make it look easy, uh, it actually did. Uh, but it, on, the, on show day, it looked easy. So it was a cool moment, really cool. Shooting down the satellite sends a strong message to the Soviets. We convinced the Soviets they shouldn't use it for military purposes because we'll smack them. And, and we could, and we, we at least demonstrated that. With this success, the F-15 seems up for anything, but its biggest challenge is still ahead. Nearly 20 years after it first rolled out, the F-15 has to prove itself to the people who brought it to life. No American has ever used an F-15 in combat, yet. August 1990. 100,000 Iraqi troops invade neighboring Kuwait. Iraqi Prime Minister Saddam Hussein is out for oil and for blood. 39 nations vow to liberate Kuwait from Hussein's clutches. Gulf War I is imminent. The United States leads the way. We must resist aggression or it will destroy our freedoms. The coalition's plan starts with a full-scale air attack. They call it Operation Desert Storm. The first job for Operation Desert Storm was to gain control of the air. And the leading role in that fell to the F-15. January 17, 1991, the start of the first Gulf War. Eight F-15 Eagle interceptors lift off. A strike force of coalition bombers follows behind. My mission goal was basically to take the Eagles out in front, about 100 miles out in front of the strike package, and clear the air of any adversary aircraft. Marine Captain Chuck McGill was an exchange pilot with the Air Force and a mission commander during Operation Desert Storm. We were protecting 40 F-16s. The F-16s were carrying two 2,000-pound two, 2, bombs. The bombs are meant for al Takadum Airfield and Weapons Center, 45 miles west of Baghdad. Al-Takadum was a place 
where planners feared Saddam Hussein might have chemical or biological weapons. The coalition had to neutralize the effect of the chemicals or of the biological weapons that might be stored there. Something else is at El Takadum too, the Iraqi Air Force. A long war with Iran has turned them into seasoned fighters. The Iraqi Air Force was a substantial air force, the fourth or fifth largest air force in the world. And they were very well equipped with aircraft. They had the newest MiG-29, so we expected to see a real air battle coming. About 20 miles west of their target, the F-15s get an urgent message from the Airborne Warning and Control Center. They had intel that there were two MiG-29s airborne south of the target. I immediately yell, push it up, push it up. So now we go full afterburner in the Eagle, which is, you really start hauling now, and we're chasing them down. McGill and his wingman quickly realize they've fallen into a trap. We started getting launch indications from surface-to-air missiles. At first, we blew it off, thinking that it was, that oh, can't be, there's nothing there. Well, there was something there. And so we came under heavy anti-aircraft uh, attack. With McGill and his squadron distracted by the missiles, the MiGs close in for a fight. They went from 380 to about 650. So now something's up. When I see the closure between the two airplanes is 1,295 knots. So we are smoking at each other. There's not a lot of time. With the Iraqi MiGs just seconds away, McGill locks onto his target and fires. The first missile was down low, and it came up and popped the MiG right in the right wing root. When I go to fire the second missile, everything got quiet. I could tell I was moving, but I couldn't feel that I was moving. I watched the missile come off, and I just watch it kind of float away. It lasted maybe four or five seconds, and then all of a sudden, it's like someone hits you with a cymbal. All the noise comes back, and it's hectic as it can be, and you're moving, moving away again. Then you look down at the MiGs, and they're about 9,000 feet below you in a slant range, and they blow up. Less than 10 minutes after spotting the MiG, McGill has obliterated his attacker. And America has finally used the F-15 in combat. The F-15s basically remove the threat of all the Iraqi MiGs. Minutes later, the rest of the coalition strike force roars in behind. They make quick work of al takadam and other military targets. They had no hope. We shot down 34 of the airplanes in the first two or three nights. After that, the air fight was over. Operation Desert Storm is the most effective air campaign the world has ever seen. The Iraqi early warning system has completely failed, and their aircraft have been caught totally by surprise. General Schwarzkopf, the commander, had staked a lot on being able to clear the skies of the Iraqi MiGs. That let the U.S. and coalition armies move unmolested on the ground. With their air support destroyed, entire battalions of Iraqi soldiers surrender to Allied forces. You know, the objective here is not to have a fair fight. The objective is to have overwhelming, decisive victory immediately. After the Gulf War, the F-15 seems poised to dominate the skies forever. But it's about to learn that sometimes, the higher you go, the harder you fall. November 2nd, 2007, an F-15 is on a routine training mission when the unthinkable happens. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane starts to break apart. He was in about a 6G turn. And the way it came apart was literally the cockpit broke off the fuselage. 
and uh, the pilot ejected. He was injured, but he ejected. The F-15 crashes into the Missouri countryside. It's the sixth time the plane has crashed in just five years. The accident board reconstructs the crash and discovers something alarming. The accident board found that two of the main support pieces that run along the cockpit and the fuselage had failed. And when they failed, the whole thing broke up, broke apart. There's no plane on Earth that can bring the F-15 down. But there's one thing that even the F-15 can't beat, age. And at that point, the airplane operationally was like 30 years old. And airplanes do age, and they do have structural problems if they've been overstressed, you know, too many Gs pulled and that sort of thing. It isn't easy to keep a 30-year-old plane running. It takes 160 men and women to coax each aging fighter into the sky. Imagine a whole fleet of 15 1980s Lamborghinis and taking those Lamborghinis at 150 miles an hour on a track every day. Doing that would be an immense feat in the civilian world, and that's exactly pretty much what we do here. We do lots of thorough inspections every time they come down from flight. Uh, take about anywhere from two to three hours. So any kind of, from anything small, from a dent in the panel, cracking the panel, to a major component malfunction up in the air. Our minimum turn time is two and a half hours. Those are actually to, uh, orders that are signed by the Secretary of the Air Force uh, that come down to the troops and say, here is exactly how you're supposed to do maintenance. After the accident in 2007, the Air Force immediately tightens inspection requirements. The new inspection guidelines come too late to save the F-15 in Missouri, but they may have saved many other lives. There are 670 F-15s in service. After inspection, the Air Force grounds almost 300 of them indefinitely. Aerodynamicists rate fighters for a certain number of hours, and after that, all the upgrades in the world don't give you the structural stability and confidence that you have when the aircraft has only a few thousand hours on it. The F-15 may be the toughest fighter on Earth, but ironically, its high standards have paved the way for its own demise. April 1997, Marietta, Georgia. At the Lockheed Martin assembly plant, the Air Force unveils its latest weapon, the F-22 Raptor. So the decision to start research on the F-22 was really to continue the F-15 tradition of having a dominant air superiority fighter that was far better than anything the Soviet Union or anyone else could field. Just as the F-15 had improved cockpit avionics, the F-22 took this even a step further with integrated displays in the cockpit. The F-22 also had more internal fuel carriage and internal weapons carriage. The F-22 brings to the table a new airframe, even more maneuverable, more agile than the F-15, but it also has uh, low observable stealth technology that makes it difficult for other radars to see it. The F-22's technology is impressive, but it comes at a cost. A whopping $412 million for each F-22, over 10 times as much as an F-15. The United States is slowly phasing the F-15 out of service but orders from other countries have the production line running until 2019. There are still over 1,200 F-15s in service all over the world, including the US, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Japan, and Korea. The F-15 remains a cornerstone of every Air Force that's ever bought it. It's still a huge part of air superiority. It's the most dominant fighter the world has ever known, and it leaves a powerful legacy. 
the legacy of the F-15 is the knowledge that we must never compromise on air superiority. To date, the F-15 has achieved 104 aerial victories or kills against other airplanes, uh, and it has never lost. So its kill ratio is 104 to zero. Uh, this is unprecedented in aerial warfare. The F-15 is like no other fighter that came before it. More versatile and more deadly. It blazed the way for the United States Air Force to become the most lethal air fighting force on the face of the earth. And it gave its allies a shot at power too. Until another plane proves faster, stronger, or more deadly, the F-15 remains the king of the skies. In the mid-1930s, the RAF struggles to improve its aging fleet of planes, while its clearest rival, Germany, develops and builds the fastest and deadliest planes in the world. To close the gap, the RAF forms a competition for a plane that can intercept the speedy German bombers. RJ Mitchell was the chief designer of the Supermarine Aviation Company. He was um, a very direct man, a very talented man. He designed superb aeroplanes uh, that were really quite fast and maneuverable. So he was used to working with new technology, but more than that, he saw the storm clouds of war rising within Germany, and he knew Europe would be at war. He was a very sick man. He was dying of cancer, and he knew that, but he felt he was keen to ensure that the Royal Air Force had the best aeroplane that they could have before he passed away. His first few attempts to design an aeroplane to meet that specification were not particularly successful, but he kept going. Mitchell and his design team hit on a radical idea, giving the plane a thin elliptical shaped wing. The problem the design team had was to combine power with speed and agility and have a formidable weaponry to down the enemy fighters and bombers. The solution the design team came up with was this thin elliptical wing that met the performance requirements, but could allow a retractable landing gear and an array of weaponry, four machine guns per wing, that could be adapted to accommodate cannon. Mitchell and his design team create the airframe, and Rolls-Royce builds its heart, a new super-powered engine called the Merlin. Marrying Mitchell's designs with the Rolls-Royce Merlin is going to create one of the greatest aircraft in the history of warfare. Racing at speeds over 350 miles per hour, climbing 2,500 feet per minute, and able to outturn most German planes, the Spitfire is a pilot's dream. So the Spitfire First and foremost is a graceful looking aeroplane. That doesn't hide the fact though that it's a sleek killing machine. It fits you well, you sit in the aeroplane, you feel like you wear the aeroplane, you feel like you're part of it. She smells good, you know, she's quite hot, that big Rolls Royce Merlin engine that's only a few feet in, in front of your feet. You just have to think I want to go in that direction. You just gently move the stick and she responds beautifully for you. She gives you confidence. And that's one of the key things as a somebody going into war in an aeroplane. You've got to be at one with your machine. You've got to be confident in that machine, your ability to operate it. The Spitfire's unique silhouette and the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine's distinctive growl become the symbol of British resistance. December 1950. Four American F-86 Sabres dart through Korean airspace in dire need of a victory. 25,000 feet below, communist North Korea has waged war on the South and its United Nations allies for six months. Here on the ground, it's hell on Earth. 
Many Americans are feeling very confident coming out of the end of World War II with a victory, and all of a sudden, they are met with a disastrous defeat at the opening of the Korean War. Overhead, chaos strikes as North Korea's Soviet comrades unleash MiG-15 jets. Facing them are inferior F-80s and F-84s. MiG-15 was much faster, uh, could go much higher, uh, and had really good armament on the airplane that totally outclassed the F-80 and the F-84. Desperate. The U.S. Air Force calls up its newest weapon, the F-86 Sabre jet. December 17th, at Kimpo Airfield, ground crews prepare the Sabres for battle with the MiG. Leading the hunt is Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Hinton. Like the entire U.S. Air Force, Hinton is eager to see how the Sabre matches up against its tenacious rival. His F-86s are untested in combat, and he's only taking four to the raid. This could be a suicide mission. Deep in North Korean territory, Hinton's strategy is to deceive the MiGs. For this mission against these MiG-15s, Hinton used the element of surprise by using the call signs of F-80s to make MiGs think that this was a vulnerable group of slower fighters. Suddenly, the number two pilot spots enemy aircraft 7,000 feet below. The trap is set. The MiGs have no idea there are Sabre jets flying high above them. The Sabre pilots peel off in pursuit of their targets. Hinton aims for the closest bogey peppering the MiG as he watches smoke trail from its wing. But there's no time for celebration. In the heated dogfight, Hinton strays from his wingman. A dangerous move. To make it home alive, he must finish the MiG solo. The flight leader presses in on his opponent. He unloads 1,500 rounds. The MiG erupts in flames. For the first time, America's state-of-the-art jet has taken out a MiG. The Sabre has arrived, and the US Air Force has the first victory in its newest combat assassin. First air-to-air -air kill of an F-86 against a MiG-15 is a great moment, not just for Hinton personally, but it also represents that we've entered this new age and this epic rivalry that's going to become so iconic. June 5th, 1945. North Airfield, Tinian Island. A group of 45 B-29 bombers take off towards the Japanese mainland. Once airborne, the crew of the B-29 Sweet Su set course for the city of Kobe. Kobe was a big industrial city. The population is somewhere around 300,000. And we were aiming for the steel mill, which was in the south central part of the city. First Lieutenant Don Dwyer was a B-29 bombardier with the 9th Bomb Group in World War II. As the fleet of B-29s reach the city of Kobe, all eyes are on the Sweet Sioux. As the lead plane's bombardier, it's up to Dwyer to hit the target first. Dwyer peers through his bombsite and locks on to the steel mill. But as the B-29s prepare to drop, a swarm of Japanese fighters are waiting for them. Sweet Sue's gunners begin spraying the sky with bullets. They'll need to keep the fighters at bay 
until Dwyer can release the payload. Dwyer hits the switch and drops his 19-bomb payload. The other B-29s follow suit, hitting right on target. Everybody gave a sigh of relief that this was over with and let's get out of here. But as Dwyer looks up from his bomb site, there's a Japanese fighter headed right for them. We had a zero coming for the car. His intention probably was to ram it. Dwyer quickly grabs his gun sight and aims at the incoming fighter. I waited for his uh, wingtip to come into the circle and gave him one burst. His shots are right on the money. But the fighter gets one in of his own. He hit us with four 20 millimeter cannon shells. Two of them took out uh, two of the engines. With only two engines still running, they won't have enough power to make it back to Tinian. We knew we were gonna have to contact Iwo Jima and make a landing there. The newly captured island of Iwo Jima is the halfway point between Japan and the B-29's home base at Tinian. The Sweet Sioux comes in low and hits the runway hard. Once we got down and we realized that we were safe, we were overjoyed at that point. With three confirmed and two probable kills, the crew of the Sweet Sioux has had one of the most successful run-ins against Japanese fighters in the war. May 18th, 1953. Captain Joe McConnell takes off in his Sabre with a record-breaking 13 victories. McConnell has been flying in combat for eight months. Today is his last day in Korea. It's quiet as McConnell and his wingman, Dean Abbott, approach MiG Alley. Suddenly, the duo spot a pair of MiGs. McConnell must decide, make it home alive or risk his life for one more mission. McConnell gambles on a daring final sortie and speeds after the bogeys. But just as the Sabres close in for the kill, 28 MiGs ambush the eager Americans. For McConnell, it's just where he wants to be. He sees a big formation of MiGs. That's just what he wanted. He flies into that formation knowing that some of the MiG-15s will turn and slow down. That means McConnell can catch them. McConnell breaks hard and flies straight into a MiG formation. Rolling in behind one, he takes it out. Then, on the tail of a second Soviet jet, McConnell rips off another burst and tears it apart. Now, MiGs swarm from all directions. They're attacking so fast and thick, they're in danger of shooting each other down. Remaining calm, McConnell and Abbott miraculously escape the chaotic melee. McConnell was a great shot. He was cool in combat from all his experience in World War II, and he knew how to employ the right tactics to make the MiG-15s make a mistake so McConnell could line up a clean shot. The pair outrun the mix back across the Korean border. Running on fumes, they barely make it back to base. McConnell adds three more MiGs to his name. With 16 confirmed kills, he's a triple ace and the Korean War's top scorer. The nature of fighter pilot culture emphasizes competitiveness. For McConnell to end up on top as the top scoring ace is huge, not only personally, but he certainly becomes a role model for others to look up to. After three years of combat, McConnell and his co-pilots finally gain air superiority. 
In the summer of 1953, a ceasefire officially ends their brutal warring career. America's celebrity ace returns home to the California desert. He's met with fanfare and a warm embrace from his wife, Pearl. But in a devastating twist of fate, he's killed a year later in the jet that made him a star. When the Air Force offers him a chance to become a test pilot, naturally, he leaps at it. But it's a new variant of the F-86 that will end McConnell's life. McConnell not only survived some of the most harrowing combat of the Korean War, he was extremely successful at it. McConnell's death is just more evidence of how dangerous test piloting really was during this time. The B-29. It's the aircraft that revolutionized long-range bombing. Behind me is the B-29 Super Fortress. This aircraft was a marvel of engineering and manufacture and the most expensive weapon system of World War II. The B-29 is 99 feet long, nearly 28 feet tall, and its wingspan measures out to a whopping 141 feet. To get it off the ground, the Super Fortress relies on four massive piston engines. Well, these are Curtis Wright 3350s, and they're 2,200 horsepower apiece. So they provide a lot of power, but at a heavy aircraft like this, you certainly need it. These supply the 60-ton bomber with enough power to reach speeds up to 365 miles per hour. Combined with altitudes up to 32,000 feet, the Army Air Forces hope the B-29s can get in and get out before the Japanese even know they're there. The B-29 is armed with enough firepower to make it an aerial fortress. Here I have twin 50 caliber Browning uh, machine guns. They're attached to a lower gun turret. We have an upper gun turret and several others around the aircraft that make this a formidable weapon system. The B-29's five gun turrets are located on the top, bottom, and tail of the aircraft. The four gunners and the bombardier can take control of the turrets remotely using the B-29's computerized system. This is the gun sighting device, and whichever uh, of the gun turrets I have control over, and that can vary, will be uh, connected to this device, and if I rotate it, that tilts the guns up and down. If I twist, it'll turn the gun turret. As an enemy fighter approaches, one gunner can take control of multiple turrets. Using the computerized gun sights, the B-29's targeting system estimates the path of the aircraft and calculates where to fire. It was very well respected by the fighters because they knew if they got anywhere near this aircraft, they were gonna get obliterated. January 1933, out of the ashes of a global depression, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler clinches an iron grip on the German Republic. The dangerous new Fuhrer brazenly defies World War I disarmament orders and rapidly begins mobilizing German forces. Across the channel, the British Air Force relies on proven technology, biplanes, but these planes have one major disadvantage, speed. Biplane design was just what pilots wanted in World War I. It was maneuverable. You could tuck and turn, but the biplanes of World War I weren't very fast. Advanced engines now allow planes to fly at groundbreaking speeds. But while biplanes are stable and maneuverable, they're limited to how fast they can fly. When a biplane reaches over 200 miles per hour, its double set of wings causes drag and makes the plane unstable. In Germany, the Luftwaffe soon realized a single set of wings, or monoplane, 
creates the balance between stability and speed. The Germans' bombers are built around new, fast engines that can easily outpower the RAF's aging biplanes. A modern war looms in Europe. The British must refuel their strapped economy and rebuild their air force with a new air fleet. At Hawker Aircraft, aeronautical expert Sidney Cam has a cost-effective solution. Cam turns to his trusted Hawker Fury biplane and gives it an innovative makeover. He retains the wooden framing and fabric fuselage of his Fury, but replaces its double set of wings with a single set. He encloses the cockpit, then widens and retracts the landing gear. The result is a halfway house between the old and the new, perfect for a war on limited resources. The Hawker Hurricane was largely constructed from a mixture of wood and fabric. This is known as conventional aircraft construction. And at the time, it meant that the airplane was much faster to build, as well as much easier to repair. This meant that Hurricanes were able to be repaired by their ground crews when aircraft like the Spitfire were being written off for similar battle damage. It also meant that the Hurricane could be produced in quantity much faster because the infrastructure to build this type of aircraft fuselage was well and truly in place in England, whereas all metal aircraft fuselages were a relatively new advancement. Inside its adaptable frame is the Hurricane's greatest asset, the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. With the Merlin engine, the Hawker Hurricane became the first monoplane fighter to go faster than 300 miles per hour. It was the first of the fighters to go into production. That meant that by late 1939, the RAF had 600 Hurricanes in the inventory. That would turn out to be a crucial margin. In 1937, the RAF incorporates the fast, easy-to-produce hurricane into service. May 27, 1944. Hundreds of Allied bombers fill the sky, all headed for Ludwigshafen, Germany, home to a critical Nazi fuel refinery. Clarence Bud Anderson was an American P-51 fighter pilot and triple ace in World War II. Anderson and his group of P-51 Mustang fighters are there to escort the massive bomber group. If the German 109 strike, it will be up to Anderson to fend them off. We were just about to the target area just about getting into Germany when my wingman calls out, we got bogeys coming after us from five o'clock high. Anderson looks up and spots an incoming swarm of German fighters. Anderson pulls into a sharp turn, desperate to draw the 109s away from the bombers. And I look back, I go, oh my God, he's coming after us. In no time, Another 109 is on his tail. Anderson tries to shake it, but the 109 holds on tight. All of his moves were aggressive. I knew I was fighting somebody that had full combat, because <laughs> he knew what to do. Out of options, Anderson pulls back hard on his stick, and the two fighters rocket upwards. As they climb, the 109 slowly inches its nose higher into firing position. Looking back there, seeing an enemy airplane on your tail is not a good feeling. Pushing their aircraft to the limit, both fighters are on the verge of stalling. And we're both going like this, and somebody's gonna lose their airspeed and stall out. And the first guy that does that is going to be in trouble. Just in time, the 109 sputters and begins to fall. Boy, it was just a great relief, and I, whew, I could follow him down sitting right there again. 
Anderson dives in pursuit. Now hot on the tail of the 109. So I thought, oh, by God, I'm going to try to get inside of him this time. So I, I cut inside of him. I said, hot dog, I'm, I'm going to make it. I could tell I was going to get inside of him. He locks his gun sight onto the 109 and puts his finger on the trigger. I glanced at my ball and got it in the middle. Fire burst, and I got spectacular results. I got it all over the engine, the cockpit. It just lights up like a Christmas tree. The 109 spirals downwards, billowing smoke as it falls. And I can see his shadow on the ground. And pretty soon, wow, bang, he and his shadow met tremendous explosion. Anderson clears out, breathing a sigh of relief. He was probably the best, best pilot I ran into in the, the whole war in Europe. In the first half of World War II, the Zero dominates, flying circles around Allied planes. There's about five of these in the, uh, in the world that are flying today. Mark Murphy restores and flies vintage Zeros. The greatest strengths that the Zero has by far is its agility. It's a light airplane. This airframe is one of the thinnest of any of the combat airplanes. That light airframe gives Zero pilots superior speed and handling. It just goes like it's got a rocket engine on it. It's climbing and climbing, and the angle is so steep. The Zero rolls and loops easily so it can dodge bullets and deliver them. And it was a deadly combination for the Japanese pilots. The Zero twists its way into the American psyche after the attack at Pearl Harbor. December 7th, 1941. As the sun rises in Hawaii, Japan prepares to strike. Japan plans a knockout blow on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Around 8 a.m., planes rumble in the distance, hints of a gathering storm. So Admiral Yamamoto has been planning the Hawaii strike for almost a year. He's put together a force of six aircraft carriers, over 400 planes, and all the support Navy ships in order to launch a massive strike. Key in the carnage, 80 Japanese Zeros. They follow bombers, adding insult to injury. up to the Zeros to shoot down any American planes unlucky enough to take to the air. But the Zeros have another mission, and that is to use their 20-millimeter cannons to strafe. They strafe crewmen on the decks of the battleships. They strafe Hickam Field. They strafe aircraft on the ground. The Zeros, with their guns, are spreading death and destruction all across Pearl Harbor and Fort Island. With the Zero, Japan wins a shocking victory, devastating the U.S. fleet in the Pacific. For the Japanese pilots, the takeaway is confidence. They've won a huge victory. The planning has paid off, and they've seen great success, and the Zero has paid off big. It's a wonderful attack platform with its 20-millimeter guns. The attack is also a huge blow to American morale, proving Japan's fighters are far more advanced. No way are America's aviators ready for this war. Both the Army and the Navy are only beginning to get the types of planes that they'll need. Their planes are no match for the Zero. They're too slow, too heavy, and undergunned. After Pearl Harbor, the Zero clinches victory after victory in the Pacific. <laughs> 
The reputation of the Zero is at an all-time high by the middle of 1942. America's Navy aviators know that they're up against a very formidable aircraft. They'll have to use special tactics, do the best with their gunnery, and get a little bit lucky to take on the Zero. In early 1942, the Zero is the pinnacle of fighter technology, making it the perfect starting point for our top 10 planes of the war. The nuclear arms race is on, and at its center is the B-52. This is the B-52H Stratofortress. We call it the BUFF, which stands for Big Ugly Fat Fellow, although that acronym is open to interpretation. The BUFF is 156 feet long and 40 feet tall, one of the largest bombers in Air Force history. It's got a payload to match. The internal weapons bay holds a 10,000-pound nuclear bomb, and the B-52 has the speed to survive an atomic blast and make a swift getaway. It can reach 600 miles an hour. The B-52 has eight Pratt & Whitney TF-33 engines, which, when it was made in the 1950s, made it faster than some of the fighters of its day. Massive wings give the buff lift for long-range flights into Soviet territory. With in-flight refueling, it can travel even farther. With aerial refueling, the B-52s could theoretically continue to fly for hundreds of hours. In 1956, the B-52 shows the world how deadly it can be. A buff flies nonstop to an uninhabited South Pacific island and unleashes a 7,600-pound hydrogen bomb. The explosion is 200 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. The U.S. then sends B-52s armed with live nuclear bombs to patrol the Soviet Union's borders, an operation known as Chrome Dome. Operation Chrome Dome was a 24-hour alert mission in which B-52s were tasked with a specific strategic target within the Soviet Union. And if the Cold War turned hot, they would be prepared to immediately fly into the Soviet Union and strike strategic targets there. For 10 years, armed B-52s constantly circle Soviet territory. If one crashed and the nuclear weapon went off, it would have been disastrous. If it was misinterpreted, it could have meant World War III. After three crashes with no detonations, the U.S. ends Chrome Dome in 1968. But it's not the end for the B-52. The remarkable thing about the B-52 is that it has performed so many different types of missions over so many years. During the Cold War, the Air Force modifies the buff to carry up to 70,000 pounds of conventional bombs to devastating effect. Behind me is a Hawker Hurricane, the backbone of the Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain. Part of what made the Hawker Hurricane so deadly was its fearsome armament. What we have here in the wing are four British 303 caliber machine guns replicated on the other side of the aircraft for a total of eight. These machine guns were aimed slightly inboard to create the ability for the shots from these guns to intersect at a point between 300 and 500 yards out ahead of the aircraft. The Hurricane's guns are accurate, but limited to just 15 seconds of firing. Its pilots have to aim carefully and fire sparingly. July 1940, hundreds of Nazi bombers attack England, Hitler's next target in his march across Europe. Most of Europe has been overrun by the Nazis. Britain is now standing alone. The Luftwaffe has one goal, cripple the Royal Air Force, or RAF.
the British hold off the Germans for two months. But as the Luftwaffe edges forward, Great Britain needs help. It comes from Hawker Hurricanes, flown by Polish pilots. But the Polish had seen the Germans sweep through their country. They'd lost friends and fellow countrymen. They were now in the United Kingdom, and they were very keen to take the fight back to Germany. Some of the most experienced Polish pilots form 303 Squadron. So the Polish pilots were a great match for the hurricane because the Polish pilots were bringing experience in attacking bomber formations, which the RAF realized was going to be a crucial piece of the Battle of Britain. August 31st, 1940, south of London. Six pilots from 303 Squadron fly into the Battle of Britain. The first major battle fought entirely in the air. Soon, the Polish pilots spot Nazi bombers guarded by six 109s. The sleek 109 can fly circles around the outdated hurricane. The ME-109 could fly faster, it could fly higher. It's got the speed, the power, the agility. It's got a more advanced engine than the Hurricane. Then, the seasoned Polish pilots spot an opportunity. The sun is behind them. They can use that to maximize the Hurricane's strengths. As a fighter pilot, you always want to attack from up sun. So you position your formation high and above the enemy so you can come down with the tactical advantage of surprise, speed, and energy. 303 Squadron strikes from above to squeeze extra speed and firepower from the Hurricanes. So the Polish 303 pilots attack the ME-109s from very close range. It's a real payoff for the tactics they've learned from Blitzkrieg and from their training with the RAF. The 303 pilots are able to shoot down the ME-109s. In minutes, 303 Squadron shoots down six 109s. So 303 Squadron proved that the Hurricane was a great weapon. It also proved that squadrons with pilots from Europe and from the Empire would be a great asset to this global war. The hurricane delivers at a pivotal moment. Today, the fighter gets its due as a top 10 plane of the Second World War. Our Cold War countdown continues with one of America's first combat jets. It's the best U.S. fighter of the Korean War, the F-86 Sabre. Sleek and deadly, the Sabre is the first U.S. combat-ready fighter to break the sound barrier. These airplanes uh, were really the gold standard of their time. Yet in 1950, U.S. military leaders hesitate to send them to Korea, even though the Soviets are secretly backing the war. The Korean War broke out largely because the United States and Soviet Union could not afford to engage each other in direct combat. And so they began to use proxies, other nations, to essentially uh, push their ideas and to test the limits of their power. In June 1950, the Soviets aid North Korea's invasion of the South and provide its top frontline fighter, the MiG-15. An international coalition led by the U.S. jumps to the South's defense. The Allies are stunned when the MiGs, often piloted by Russians, down their bombers at alarming rates. To escort the B-29s, the U.S. rushes the F-86 into the fray. This is the North American F-86 Sabre, the premier fighter in the skies over Korea. 
Its speed was based on a combination of a powerful axial flow jet engine and a unique and innovative swept wing design, allowing the aircraft to fly at speeds exceeding 650 miles an hour. The Sabre's not just fast, it's agile. The F-86 could snap back and get behind a MiG-15 in the blink of an eye. With a MiG in its sights, the Sabre can unleash awesome firepower. If six guns shooting, it would shoot 125 50 caliber rounds in one second. It's truly incredible. In December 1950, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Hinton lands the assignment to lead the first Sabres into combat. Hinton's flight is high above the bomber force when the number two spots MiG-15s below. The Sabres peel off in pursuit. Hinton sneaks up behind a MiG and opens fire. His bullets strafe the wing and fuel trails out. But the tough MiG-15 keeps flying. Hinton's get, trying to pull right up behind this guy and get very close to him and hammer him. With two long bursts, Hinton finally lands 1,500 rounds on the MiG's tail. It bursts into flames. The first sabered victory of the war. The F-86, in the hands of a skilled fighter pilot, was the deadliest fighter of its time. 